Hello, my name is Bob Brown, and I'm recording this on May 15th, 2016. This is for the Walden University Seminar in IT Innovation, the Doctoral DBA Program 85112-1. This is for Group A, Weeks 2 and 3. And the title of my presentation for innovation is the transition from multitasking to multi-selves. The, some of the mega trends uh, for, for the DBA IT professional 21st century, I feel that the biggest mega trend we're going to face is artificial intelligence, and particularly artificial intelligence for enterprise resource planning systems for business management. The reason I say this is that uh, we need to develop an entirely new way of looking at brain science, cognitive science, computer science for supply chain management. Supply chain management is a critical human skill that we need to develop everything from you know, the pollution of the environment, uh, wars in the Middle East over oil, a scarcity of resources, rare earth minerals, political posturing over critical supplies. This all has to be, be brought into a scientific worldview and to be managed for the benefit of everyone without in hampering or impacting the free market. That's a very difficult thing to do and with artificial intelligence we can start managing the resources we have very effectively. One idea I'm also looking at is what I call virtual, virtual selves virtual employees, and corporate system personalities. What I've seen and what I've been trying to do in my career is develop computer systems that are actually somewhat an extension of myself. All computer systems are really an extension of the human mind. They are really artifacts, they're creations, they're phantoms of the human mind. So when I leave work at night, as an IT professional, I want my computer systems to carry on doing work because the computers are powered 24 by 7, they're consuming resources, therefore in a world of scarce resources where your computer could be powered by coal, you need to get every ounce of work out of it to be efficient that you can. Otherwise it needs to go into a power down state. So virtual selves is basically start off very simply. This is a robotic or automatic program. It could be as simple as an Excel macro that does repetitive tasks for you. These are your virtual selves, micro uh, atomic cellular self that is doing small tasks. And gradually you build more and more of these until they become more of a swarm technology that can accomplish a lot of things for you. Corporate system personalities, what I've also noticed on this, that with ERP systems, whether that's SAP, Microsoft Dynamics AX, or Oracle, that when you put a large-scale system in, it will psychologically affect the entire workforce, positive or negative. Unfortunately, many ERP systems go in, and people have a very negative view of it. They weren't brought in, they, they didn't get uh, buy-in, this was a top-down, hierarchical push-down on top of the organization, and people resent it. And that can make people not trust the system. And later on I'll show you a section where psychologists say that not only should you trust the system, you have to have the system trust you. Because if you have an ERP system, Enterprise Resource Planner, and you're running MRP, Material Resource Planner, or MPS, Material Production Scheduling, and you don't trust the results, that lack of trust will permeate the entire system. And the entire system is an extension of everyone's personality around you. So if you don't trust the system, then the system, which is which is right now is the human beings that are interacting with the system, they won't trust you or the system either, and it's a very vicious cycle. So as a, as a doctor of business, when you encounter systems that people don't trust, you have to establish a sense of trust on both sides. The system, the corporate personality, the composite of everyone, and the individual interacting with it. I'm also interested in predictive forecasting of demand, self-organizing networks, and I'm, what I am researching now is on IBM Watson using somewhat some Apple Siri, and I'm using more and more the micro, Microsoft Cortana because right now I'm in an implementation for Microsoft AX. 
And last but not least, AI Enterprise Resource Planners. We really have to get ERP systems more and more managed by AI systems to take the cognitive workload off individuals. For slide three and four, uh, the literature synthesis overview, uh, competitive advantage provided by information advantage is uh, called capita, almost like uh, per capita. And this is from uh, Sethi and King, 1984, development of measures to assess, to assess the extent to which an information technology application provides competitive advantage. One thing that really surprised me was that one-third of all business capital expenditures are computer or software resource related. One-third. That's, that's, that's amazing. But what I found in my own personal life is that oftentimes IT people are not at the leadership table. And that has to change. And one way you can explain that is that if over one-third, if one-third of all capital expenditures is going to be IT related, IT professionals, IT managers, IT directors, doctors of business with uh, uh, admin with IT concentration, we have to be at the table because one third of the business we're, we're spending the money. Also in this uh, article there was talk about primary efficiency, support activity, resource management, acquisition threat, and preemptive being preemptive preemptive innovators and synergy. And since everything is transitioning to the internet digital economy in some way, IT people have to be there. Firms should create a new paradigm to work with customers, suppliers, and business partners. And we, you must assess, and this is a good thing for doctors of business, you must assess your customer, your clients, online information capabilities, their OIC. That's a good measurement to measure a client or customer. What is their OIC footprint? The theory of resource-based view applies to IT. This article talks about that. Treat employees, IT resources, and knowledge as rare and variable. And I put hooray in here because oftentimes IT people are not viewed as, as valuable. They're viewed as kind of a necessary evil, and that has to change. So in, in closing on these slides, on three and four, I would say the big takeaway is that we, IT, uh, we're the major, uh, we're the major impetus for efficiencies. We are probably the number one support activity in the organization. We probably, IT professionals as innovators, we have a help desk. How many other departments have a help desk? Is there an accounting help desk? There may be a customer sort, uh, customer service help desk, but for internal resources, we don't have that. For slides five and six, uh, literature synthesis continues. The McAfee and Rhino Javasan investing in, in the IT that makes a competitive difference. Uh, the synthesis, the takeaway from this article is IT investment can lead to intensification of competition by companies who heavily invest in capital IT spending. I've seen that myself. My own, my com, uh, my current employer, we have invested $1.5 million in a uh, Microsoft Dynamics AX implementation. 
And in the mining world, we are probably one of the most modernized, technologically advanced IT. We have the most uh, technologically advanced IT systems there is. And this clearly is starting to show itself. We're able to predict uh, where the strata and the ore is in the earth. We're able to give customers um, uh, decreased lead times. Our lead times are 50% less than our nearest competitor. Honestly, we don't even have a competitor anymore. We have other people in the market, but it's not even a blue ocean con concept or a red ocean where we're in competition with them. There are just people who prefer to go to the smaller competitors because they're they're geographically closer. Uh, it's but we have the IT system that we've created has created has protected us from barriers of entry. So it's very true for what this article talks about that your IT system can uh, it can intensify the competition to the point that no one can compete with you. Um, it has to be spent wisely and yet be careful. Um, the authors also point out that IT and especially uh, ERP systems since the 1990s have created an environment for business consolidation. I've seen this true too. This can kind of be a negative. If people have uh, ERP systems, then syst companies can buy or absorb or acquire other companies easier, especially if they have very flexible ERP systems, enterprise resource planners because they can migrate those companies in very quickly. From an IT perspective, I've seen this myself where you'll have two companies and they kind of, when they acquire each other, they have different ERP systems. And if you're on the losing ERP side and you're the IT person, you will probably lose your job. That's exactly what happened to me and I had to go find another job. And a lot of times the decisions are not made scientifically or rationally. It can also often be an emotional decision. It can be people in one organization posturing to protect their own political base, and that political base includes the IT people and systems. In my own case, I can say quite frankly that the systems we had were probably 20 years ahead of the other system. We had automated systems. We had artificial intelligence uh, systems that were monitoring our forecasting and they were monitoring our supply chain and our management. We had really spent almost 20 years to make ourselves the, the market leader with information systems. We acquired, our company acquired another system, uh, company. Those people politically outmaneuvered our people and they put their systems in. Now what was the net effect? Well we lost our jobs, but the company that bought this acquisition and then switched to our very low level IT we went from $12 million a month in revenue to 2.5. That is That shows you that without IT, without planning, and be able to do available to promise the customers, to tell customers exactly when you're going to deliver their product, if you aren't able to do that anymore, and you start, giving, and you start pushing out old-fashioned lead times, and you say, I'm, you start, people say, I'll, I'll put a six-week arbitrary lead time in it, you will literally lose your business. And in the case of the company I used to work for, <clears throat> excuse me, that was almost $10 million, over $10 million, close to $10 million a month, a month was lost. That's $120 million a year. As you, the company I work for now, we're spending $1.5 million to put an ERP system in. So I tell people that all the time. 1.5 million may sound like a lot of money, and it is, but look at the company I used to work for when they tore out our systems, put in very inadequate systems, and then you were only at best be able to tell customers we have a six week lead time, and you couldn't do any better than that. Their business dropped dramatically from just from that simple fact of being able to, to Give them the information, and this and so there is an arms race mentality in IT systems. There's and there's evolutionary pressure from IT systems. Only the best performing companies will survive, and the best performing companies are those companies that can find the information that ultimately will solve their customers' business problems. So we are in an arms race. If you're in a company that's I'm not on the fast track with IT. It's not only bad for your career, it's bad for the investors, it's bad for the customers, and it's bad for the company overall. 
A couple of takeaways from this article were deploy a consistent platform, not a jumble of systems. Too often you see this. Um, for example, our company, we decided to use cloud systems. And you think, well, that would get rid of my job if I'm an IT person, only if you won't innovate. So we've used the cloud systems, Google Drive, Google Mail. Um, we put our Microsoft Dynamics AX system in a cloud, and we can access it from anywhere. Even our phone system, although it's locally based, it's available into the cloud. That way you can set up your office anywhere. We can set up a field office with full access to all our systems, drop an HP printer that has email capability right there next to them, and in a moment's notice, we have a new office set up. We can literally go from, if there's Wi-Fi available, or an AT&T or a Verizon hotspot, we can literally have an office or a presence anywhere in the world in a matter of minutes. That's true innovation, is to be able to, be, to deploy. So by using cloud systems, cellular systems, and being able to think outside the box, like buy HP printers and use their email systems within it as a printing option versus trying to print through conventional means, that has revolutionized our business. Slides uh, 7 and 8 uh, on the Piccoli and Ives, IT independent strategies and initiatives sustain competitive advantage, a review and synthesis of the literature. Uh, sustainable competitive advantage, uh, as I've alluded to earlier, when you give up the capability of being able to give your customers information immediately when they call, you're at a serious competitive disadvantage. With the advent of smartphones and cell phones in many mission critical situations when a customer needs a part from you as a supplier, they're going to call you and you need to be able to turn to your ERP system and within a matter of minutes at the max, you need to be able to give a customer an answer when you can promise to, to deliver a product. When we go online with Amazon, and Amazon is the world leader in this, you can have, if the part's available, and it's in stock and you're in the United States, Canada, Western Europe, or many major capitals of the world, that product will be here tomorrow. With the new drone technology that Amazon is doing, they'll be able to deliver critical parts to you in a matter of minutes or hours, especially if you're in the Silicon Valley or San Francisco or Los Angeles area or New York City or Chicago. There's going to be a lot of issues on drones, drone piloting, licensing, IT controls of uh, drones, that's a whole new area of IT that's expanding that uh, I personally want to take a look at. Uh, a couple more points here. Uh, I won't go through them all, but one of the biggest thing is IT protects and creates barriers against market erosion. This is a very critical idea. Your IT system, your knowledge system, your forecasting system, your predictive uh, capability system, I like to call it a predictive capability. What, what are we capable of? And let's predict what we're capable of, because that's really what MRP and MPS, Material Resource Planner, Material Production Scheduler, Customer Resource Manager, all these tools, they're really to predict. They give us the ability to predict our predictive capability. I like to call it our predictive capability. And we need to be able to have that, because having the better predictive capability than your competitor will give you a market advantage every time. If you can run a micro ER, uh, MRP run that tells your customers who have very specific needs that I can have that product for you on Thursday, and not only do I know that you'll get it on Thursday, I know how I'm going to ship it, and I also will have your, your uh, UPS uh, uh, ticket number available. That's what people want. They want the ability to track the product, know the product showing up, and to be, that you're a dependable supplier. And you're only going to be able to do all those things with a good IT or ERP system. And personally, on ERP systems, whether you go SAP, Microsoft Dynamics AX, or Oracle, 
It's really more in the implementation and the capability that you as the implementer, the director of the installation of these systems, that's the key. And we'll talk about that later about the trust barrier, the trust barrier and the trust bridge that you have to build or tear down between the users and the system. Because in the way a system is basically, an ERP system in many ways is a gestalt of the corporation's entire mental capacity and psyche. So it's a gestalt system, and we'll talk more about that later. And going along the lines of the Peters, Peter Singe, uh, the develop knowledge launch capabilities, be capable of launching new capabilities using IT technology. Look at the gaps in literature, look at the gaps in knowledge, look at the, the difference between experience and the academic world. Here's some of the things that I'd like to go over. As doctor of business, we need to always focus on the business, how IT can support that business. Too often, IT people are guilty of doing IT for IT's sake or doing things by rote because that's all they've ever done. The business problem must be understood first. I recommend doing a breakout session using white paper or butcher block paper on the wall, using simple sticky notes, and you business process map what the business is. And then you tell people you're going to be allowed to dream. What could we do differently as a business process? Don't worry about the computer right now. What could we do different as a business process that we can streamline this, make the customers' lives better, make them happier, delight our customers. We want always to delight our customer. What can we do and streamline it? If you use these simple tools in a breakout session and empower the employees to make changes that affect their own job, it's powerful. It's a powerful experience. One thing I like to see is, one thing that always bothers me is IT managers or people who are put in charge or over IT, oftentimes from finance departments, they have no IT knowledge. And that's like putting a person who's a medical manager in charge of your health care versus a medical doctor. A lot of people complain that's what's going on. I don't want to talk to a medical manager. I don't think a, I don't think a medical manager is a bad person, but I need to talk to the doctor first. The doctor is going to have to treat me. So when I'm solving my business problem, you need a person who knows both business and IT. And increasingly, that's what it needs. You're going to have to have a doctor of information technology or a DBA with IT concentration to run these departments. As we saw in earlier slides, over one th third of all capital expenditures in most corporations are for IT. We have got to be the lead in this. We have got to move up to the table. We have got to move out from under finance or HR or wherever we're at. We have got to have an equal seat at that, at that table from now on. That's a big gap in the literature that we need to, to investigate and publish. A lot of times people have six systems. Uh, company I used to work for, they put in a six system, and that six system has caused a lot of damage to that company. As I said, almost $10 million a month. Now, of course, the management is going to say, they're going to blame shift and say it's something else, but a major contributor of that was not innovating, not allowing IT to help them, not all IT to help predict things. I think IT scholars, managers, or doctors of business, you need to have some hard skills, certifications, and ERP installation experience. Pure academic research is great, but you're going to have to have the hands-on experience. Fortunately for DBAs, DIT, IT professionals, almost all of us have hard, hands-on experience. An area that I'm very interested in is artificial intelligence, what I call virtual persons, multiple entities, me, and go beyond virtual reality. All of us are overtaxed, our brains are we're losing cognitive, cognitive capabilities because we have to maintain all this technology, all these computers, social media, people stay up at night trying to do research projects. We have to start creating simple systems that can grow with us, that can take off a lot of the low-level day-to-day tasks. You have to create a virtual self, a virtual person virtual assistant. You have to start using these as much as possible. And right now, 
we're still we're still in the infancy of artificial intelligence. We have powerful computer systems, but yet they're all they have to be almost constantly manned and updated by people. Facebook, as massive as it is, and I'm sure they have artificial intelligence in there, but it depends on human input to maintain it. If everybody in the world stopped inputting into Facebook, it would have literally no value. But you need what we need a Facebook of the future that can collect data. And although I know Facebook has artificial intelligence, we need systems or ERP systems is what we're interested in for this innovation seminar. The ERP systems have got to become automated. They have to start doing a lot of things on their own, auto-releasing orders, forecasting, canceling orders. We're going to have to start trusting the system enough that we can let it run its MRP run, cut purchase orders, auto-email the purchase orders, you know, get the uh, the find the information from the other suppliers, put that in the demand planning, so you know exactly when it's going to happen. But right now, a lot of people, if you ask them, they have a sick ERP system. They will not trust it. ERP systems are usually installed by teams that have in companies that have very little understanding of business. That has to change. We have to start changing that as DBA uh, scholars. Inventory control, it has to become AI demand-based forecasting. We have got to have this the capability of having AI manage the, our system. Because later on in the future slides, you'll see why it's going to become to a point where there will be no option but to use an artificial intelligence system to run your ERP system. We have a crisis of confidence in ERP systems. There's a crisis of confidence. Uh, uh, confidence in implementation teams. Implementation teams and salespeople overpromise, they overprice, they underperform. That's a real problem and it, it affects each of our professional lives and we have to change that. As a roundup, uh, artificial employees are going to become the wave of the next 10 years. Virtual businesses, I'd like to do a seminar on virtual businesses. Virtual currencies, Bitcoin, we know about that. Virtual inventories, this is a very interesting phenomenon. There are virtual inventories on a lot of ways to look at it. Virtual in inventory can be where your demand system is telling you that you can have this type of inventory at this point in time so that you can look out on a calendar and say, I have the capability of making all this material, these parts, or providing these services, or creating reports, or creating technology, or creating anything I want to create, and I can have it done at these various dates. The ability to understand the virtual inventory and a lot of its facets is a critical skill to understand. Virtual inventory can also be uh, virtual inventories in, that are just simply computer uh, products that you make. And another seminar I'd like to do one day is on game and role playing with ERP systems to put that, to bring the idea of game and role playing into an ERP system. I think that's the number one thing we're missing in ERP systems. If we have to innovate, We've got to learn the lessons of the, the video game and role-playing world of the virtual reality, the immersion, you know, the Microsoft uh, 360, PlayStation 3 and 4, where they can create these marvelous worlds. Imagine a warehouse that's designed like, like Call of Duty, where you have a Call of Duty type world where you can walk around and the customer can actually see the products. They can see how the the washer or dryer they want to buy would actually fit in their kitchen or it won't. These are powerful innovations that we have to be part of in the near future. On slide 10, the original research topic, artificial intelligence, ERP implementation, um, I've been involved in this myself for many, many years. Um, I always start with automation, auto reports. All management reports should be automated. They should be emailed automatically 
people really should not be required to go to a website or a portal to auto run a report. If they need the data, it probably should be delivered to them on a routine basis. If, there's, if they only want to do it on demand, then that's fine. They can have a portal. The other thing I recommend on that is to have a use digital signage as a program. You put up screens. You can use Google Chrome um, um, or Chromecast devices, and you can make very nowadays very efficient uh, airport type you know departure and leaving systems where people can get information updated regularly. I've done it with uh, digital signage, as I said, and I've used uh, even Excel to auto-update, to keep people update where we are on the day, where our shipments are, and as the screen, as, as our shipments go out, the screen can uh, decrease, just like flights going out of an airport. These are the types of innovations we need to look at. Auto-forecasting is something I'm, I'm very interested in, how to create systems that can auto-forecast demand. Basically, there should be the automation of all routine, repetitive road activities to AI. That's where you start. If it's repetitive, routine, or it's just done by rote, it should be going to an AI system, expert system, or a simple routine that you can record that will do it for you. When you start getting 5, 10, 15, 20 of these systems running automatically, as I have, you will be amazed at the transformation of your business and your very life. ERP systems are very demanding to maintain, create training videos, constant automation systems, bottom-up approach. AI, the AI approach of integrating into your ERP system, you should be, it should be viewed as creating a, a virtual employee or virtual self. You're creating a virtual self to do work for you. If you have to check purchase orders to make sure that they're valid, you should be thinking of a way to automate that process where you can validate against the website or validate against a database or validate against the demand planning. That way you can start offloading. Again, there's a very big uh, bias against trusting systems. You will, once you understand that people really don't trust ERP systems, they don't trust the data, they don't trust computers, you'll see how much extra work we're doing when we have these very powerful tools. The big takeaway I think I hope you get from my whole seminar session is multitasking as we know is a myth. You the human brain does not multitask at all. If it does if it does it does it very poorly. You have to switch from multitasking to multi-selfing. If you need to multitask, you need to create an AI expert system, virtual character, virtual system that can do that work for you. If you're overloaded and your boss, or you, and maybe you, you are your own boss, and you can't get any more help, start multi-selfing. Don't multitask. Start create, Use your computer or computers as, a tool, as tools that can help offload things. Offload your memory. Offload your calendaring. Offload voicemail. There's a million things these computers can do now. Take, go away from task, multi, trying to multitask to create smart systems that multi-self. We all need more than one of us to do our job nowadays. When you leave at 5 p.m., ask yourself, what can this computer do overnight that will make my life easier in the morning? Avoid cognitive or overload and brain stress. With ERP systems, I'm in the middle of implementation. I see this now. I see people at cognitive overload. They're under extreme brain stress trying to keep that ERP system alive. The implementers took their money. They're long gone. But again, they didn't think artificial intelligence. They think, well, you know, you can multitask. That's kind of the offhand remark. Well, you can't multitask. You need to multi-self. So you, if your ERP system is demanding you to do a lot of work, you're going to have to create a smart system that can interact with that system on your behalf to help take the load off.
on the on the artificial intelligence ERP inter implementation ERP integration, um, a couple of key points. Um, I think you need to look at ERP as a personality. Although this sounds strange at first, it really is the personality of your business and it will affect the personality of your business. If your end users, your management teams, if you yourself do not trust and if you do not quote unquote like the ERP system, you're going to take a very dim view of that system and the information that's contained within it. And the odd thing about that is, as I said earlier, ERP systems are also a gestalt of the of the entire organization's business personalities. All tens, you know, tens of thousands of people putting that information in there. And if people don't trust the information, ultimately that also equates to not trusting the other employees in your business. And this is a very corrosive phenomenon. Your ERP system has to have a personality, and it has to be a trusting personality, it has to be an accurate personality, it has to be an efficient personality, and you know it can even be a fun personality, a system that you want to be part of. If your ERP system has a negative connotation, or people hate the system, or that system doesn't, you know, you'll hear people say that system doesn't do anything right, that's going to affect your whole business. That is a danger sign that you have a sick system and you need to take immediate steps against this, against this, this problem. Uh, going through this quickly, there's the AI to AI smart supply chains. As I said earlier, everybody in your supply chain probably has a different ERP system. And, try, and we have all these people working in different types of ERP systems, and then they communicate to the human, uh, you know, the human layer, which is usually email or cell phone calls. Maybe they go to a web portal, but mostly it's probably emails and, and telephone calls. And so that is, the, that is the bottleneck between these systems getting efficient. We are going to have to have AI to AI smart supply chains where, where your company's ERP system is able to talk to a smart AI system in the cloud. Maybe Google will make this. Who knows? Maybe you'll make it. And then that system can communicate with Oracle, Microsoft Dynamics, uh, it can talk to, you know, QuickBooks, whatever it is. And these systems can all start interacting to get the most efficient utilization out of the entire supply chain. And then, on top of that, this is where innovation can come in. What else can this supply chain make that they're not already making? Maybe they don't know that they could make all this. I've seen it myself, very sad uh, cases of business loss where people have enormous capabilities, but they're stuck in an old business paradigm that no longer functions, yet they have the machines, they have the people, they have the, they have the know-how, they have the property to do great things, but they choose to bankrupt themselves. That's why AI to A smart supply chains that can look on a supply chain and say, by the way, all of us on this supply chain team, we can also make these new emerging products that's the power of an AI to AI supply chain management system. I've talked about virtual employees. As I said, virtual employees, artificial intelligence employees, uh, virtual uh, tour guides, and Second Life. This is going to be, this is starting to occur now, and in the next 10 years, this will be a very powerful new wave of having virtual employees. It also could cause mass world unemployment. Again, that's something we're going to have to deal with. AI, AI to AI forecasting social media. This is a uh, using social media as a mining tool, trying to find information in the social media, seeing what new, what new products, goods, and services. This goes back to the AI to AI smart chains. And we want all AI ERP networks, that's our entire supply chains or hundreds of supply chains, communicating in real time with each other. This will become necessary in times of crisis, in times of environmental problems, a time of social disorder, things, medical supplies, things need to, need to be made. What can everyone make? During the Second World War, that's exactly what happened in the United States and the Allied countries where uh, factories were converted for wartime use, as they call it. I don't think that's a bad idea. I'm not saying convert for wartime use. I'm saying convert an entire supply chain maybe to produce... Um, 
technology to fight an Ebola or a Zika virus outbreak? What do we need to do to get Zika virus, antivirus, um, to protect people around the world? You may be, you say, well, all I'd make is pallets. I make wooden pallets. How can I be a part of that? Well, the, the, the product has to be shipped on something. You're a pallet maker. The Zika, vi the, the Zika, Zika virus or the Ebola uh, antigen could be shipped on your pallets. That's a new way of thinking. And you can see across the top there, I have innovation. Ideas I'm using are, right now are IBM Watson to manage your ERP for your business. I'm doing experiments in that. Start creating your own virtual employees. Look at Second Life. See how you could use that technology or create virtual employees. They may be simple now, but they could maybe help later on. Integrate a virtual employee in your help desk. <coughs> how can AI, ask yourself, how can AI help human, human learning in my organization? How can I capture the human mental capital for my employees and get it into an AI system? Going back to my ERP as a personality. I want to capture that human capital so I can keep that knowledge in-house. Right now, with human beings, when, our, when we die or we leave a company or we no longer want to do something, that knowledge is lost. And that's an enormous amount of investment in a human mind that is simply just lost. We need to look at human perceptual data and the capturing of it and how to translate it into computers <coughs> for future generations as a critical uh, business and societal need. Build your virtual 21st work selves because this is going to help reduce burnout, human error. We've seen so much human error when people are tired. Deep water horizon in the BP oil mess in the Gulf of Mexico is a classic example of many cases where people are at cognitive overload and brain burnout and they start making bad decisions and that can go through an entire organization. AI systems that can help safeguard human beings from being human beings sometimes is a critical skill. And as I show over here, we want to have predictive forecasting, which can drive a, 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 a collective supply chain innovation. And I show you on the side here the environmental value, the challenges, the IT threats, human brain overload, sustainable is, is virtual employees. This will be slide 14. This will be my final speaking uh, slide. The rest of the... Uh, presentation is the annotated bibliographies. Um, there's, I encourage you to go through those. There's some several very interesting uh, facts that I found out. Please look at the notes. That's where I have the majority of the information in the notes section. Uh, the annotated bibliographies are about 12 pages of in a Word document for information. And I encourage you to utilize this information if you want to download it, use it. This is uh, open source, open to the public these ideas uh, for your to help your business and my my four quadrants uh, in red there I have artificial intelligence virtual employees artificial intelligence systems intercommunicating um, I see a lot of uh, I see a lot of I'm doing a lot of research myself on virtual employees and even virtual businesses virtual businesses are right now they're a way of trying a business out in virtual reality, like for example, Second Life, if you wanted to test market a product without doing a heavy investment, for example, something like Second Life or video game marketing, maybe a way of trying and testing a new idea to see how it would work in the virtual world before you actually put it into the real world. And in fact, it may work better in the virtual world than it does in the real world. For example, Farmville and Facebook, of all things, that people play that's kind of a virtual business. That's like virtual work that people have to take care of crops and animals and they have to do it all the time and they're and people are very diligent at it. This whole idea of virtual business and virtual work is fascinating, something to study. It's an area of innovation. In the light blue in the upper right hand corner, virtual employees, going into that a little depth, uh, make virtual employees work for you. Virtual businesses, virtual inventory, virtual warehousing we talked on uh, I'm doing experiments in Second Life where we can try to, uh, instead of looking at inventory from a, a simple spreadsheet point of view, looking at inventory by walking through it, actually seeing what your inventory looks like in a virtual reality world. This is something I've been trying for many years. I have had some limited success with it. 
Most people don't see the reason to do it, but to me it would be fascinating to have to be able to have my inventory, my actual inventory and pictures, and I can see it in a virtual warehouse that mirrors my physical warehouse. And again, if you have a virtual business, it's a great way for people to walk around your virtual warehouse to look for products as well. Time travel inventory. This is an innovation for inventory. I have been on maybe, I don't know, 500, 1,000 inventories, and I'm tired of taking inventory. So one idea I have, going along with virtual employees and virtual warehousing, is time travel inventory. <coughs> and what this means is, by taking a snapshot of your perpetual inventory, and then actually using, for example, a drone to do a fly-through and actually take pictures of your inventory as it was at that moment in time, then you could compare your perpetual at that moment in time to what you your drone or your, your smartphone camera found, and you compare it. And then you can, you can actually not impact your business because you could take rapid snapshots of inventory, rapid pictures of inventory, and then you would compare it to the perpetual that you printed out at that moment in time. You could also do this, this would be a very easy way to do cycle counting. By using drone technology or smartphone technology, you could take a picture of a shelf of inventory that maybe it gets used all the time. You could quickly take a snapshot or of your perpetual of your ERP system, compare the perpetual to the snapshot. The crude way would be just looking at, you have one screen up with your perpetual inventory in an Excel spreadsheet. The other screen has your snapshot of your inventory. You count the inventory, you know, just by using your eye like you would there, except you're sitting in a nice, comfortable chair, drinking a cup of coffee, taking your inventory. That's what I mean by time travel inventory. That's one of my innovations that I'm working on. And the green we, we've touched on the under AI control, ERP systems must produce predictive forecasting reports. Again, virtual reality warehouses. These are warehouses also. Another way to think of virtual reality warehouses is not just my warehouse, but my supplier's warehouse and my customer's warehouse and my competitor's warehouse. Looking at, all, looking at them all under one umbrella as a system that you could maybe utilize. And instead of having a red ocean concept, go to a blue ocean where everyone can innovate together. As we talked earlier, it's kind of like a like the United States wartime uh, conversion of factories for the war effort. This will be a conversion of the supply chain because we have a new customer, a new emerging market, and we want to work together as a team to satisfy that new emerging market. And last but not least, I'd like you as professionals to think of the ERP as the personality of your business. How do people see the ERP system that you're managing? Do they see it favorably? I know right now in my own personal case, they see the system unfavorably. To me, it's a great system. And as I said, the system's only two and a half months old. And I say, how many babies, how many dogs, how many anything at two and a half months old is very effective? And I noticed that when I use that metaphor of saying the system's only two and a half months old, and I put it in context of like how you would develop any personality, whether it's yourself or a human being or, or changing yourself or, or training your dog. It has a new light to them. They say, I said, the system only gets as smart as we train it to get smart. So the per ERP is a personality system uh, of the business. It is a gestalt combination it's a combination personality of everyone in the business, including our customers. And we have to see it that way. And by using AI, by giving ERP systems a AI interface, we're going to make it more likable, more useful, useful, and more interactive with people. Right now, ERP systems are very dictatorial to people. The screen tells me this, I go do this. The ERP systems really need an interface. They need a Cortana. They need an IBM Watson. They need an interface that sometimes lessens the dictatorial methodology that ERP systems tend to thrust at users. And if you take anything else away, what type of ERP, what type of personality does your ERP business system have? People say, well, it doesn't have a personality. It's just, it's just a machine. Well, it's more than a machine. It's a system that people are immersed in every day. They live in it. And 
our livelihoods, our customers' satisfaction to delight our customers all depend on that ERP system to provide accurate, useful information. And the key is, if people don't trust the ERP system, then they really don't trust their fellow employees putting information in. And when that happens, as I said earlier, it's very corrosive on the organization. That's why an AI system, if you have even the most basic AI system that you can start bolting on or, or interacting with the ERP system and starting changing the dynamics by having the ERP system produce automatic reports, have the ERP system work for the users by sending out automatic emails, then people will start liking the system. And when they start liking the system, they'll trust the system. When they trust the system, the system can start doing things more automatically, and you will be able to innovate towards artificial intelligence when people trust you and trust the system to help do more things for them. Again, my name is Bob Brown. I hope you enjoyed this uh, uh, presentation I made for the Walden University for the IT uh, Innovation Seminar for May of 2016. I look forward to your comments, questions, and if, if anyone gets this uh, video now or in the future and they have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email uh, will be uh, metacomputer at Yahoo. So again, I look forward to your comments, questions, and I thank you for your time watching this video.